Welcome to Fading Memories, a podcast with advice, wisdom, and hope from caregivers who have lived the experience and survived to tell the tale. Think of us as your caregiver best friend. Welcome back, everybody. Thanks again for joining us. With me today is Cindy Weinstein. She is the author of the book, Finding the Right Words. There we go. Get it on the screen. And it may not quite be what you're expecting from a book with that title, but I'm going to let her explain all that to you. So thank you for joining me, Cindy. Thank you, Jennifer. It's really an honor to be here talking with you about this. Well, thank you. So first off, you've written multiple books, right? But not on this topic. Okay. I'm an English professor at Caltech and have written several books uh, on American literature and edited several books on American literature as well. This is my first book and probably my only book that will be a memoir. And it is a book that I wrote with Dr. Bruce Miller at UCSF, and it's designed to be written for a general audience, which is also slightly different um, from my other books, which have a much more academic audience in mind. Interesting. So this book is basically you coming to understand your father's early onset Alzheimer's, and it's a bit, maybe maybe more than a bit on processing the grief that comes with that. So why don't, and, and you connected with Dr. Bruce Miller because, because of writing this book, but let's go back to the early 80s when you think your dad started showing signs of Alzheimer's and what you were doing. So just give us some of your personal history and then we can sure. fast forward to when you and Dr. Miller connected. Sure. In the early 80s, 1982 to be exact, I came to California and started a PhD at Berkeley. And I spent seven years getting that degree. And it was during that time that my father was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. At that time, all dementia was Alzheimer's. Uh, I have since learned through conversations with Dr. Bruce Miller that what my father, he definitely had early onset Alzheimer's, which means a diagnosis when one is 65 years old or younger. And based on my description of my father's clinical presentations, Bruce also thought that he had a rare form of early onset Alzheimer's because memory wasn't sort of the first symptom, but rather word finding was. And so there was a moment when I was at UCSF that I talk about in the book where Bruce tells me what he thinks the more precise diagnosis was, and that's early onset Alzheimer's with the logopenic variant. And logopenic variant means difficulty with finding words. And I noticed in the 80s that my father became much quieter, had trouble finding words. Much of my relationship with him while I was in graduate school in California and he and my mother were in Florida was over the phone. I tried to get to Florida as frequently as I could, especially after the diagnosis. But many times it was over the phone that I realized something was wrong and he would respond to my questions in a monosyllabic fashion we always used to have lengthy conversations and he would hand the phone over to my mother. So she was speaking for both of them. It was at a time when people wrote letters and I noticed that my father's handwriting degenerated. He would sometimes type letters to me. There would be a lot of typos. I just attributed it to, I don't know. I didn't know what to make of it. I didn't think of it as a symptom. Looking back, of course, um, I think these were all symptoms. And in the 80s, I also observed uh, mood change, which uh, 
was most apparent when I brought my then boyfriend, now husband, to New Jersey to visit my dad. He was staying there while my mom had moved to Florida. They were in the middle of retiring. And I said to Jim at one point, this isn't my dad. There's something wrong. And again, I attributed the mood change to the fact that he was retiring from a business that he had run with my uncle for decades. He was moving from New Jersey to Florida, excitedly moving. And yet these were all very big transitions. And so I think it's easy to convince ourselves that (laughs) there's a good reason for all these things that are happening. And you, you don't think that it's a brain health issue. I don't think you would look at, you know, because you do describe that transition between when he was in New Jersey and your mom was still in Florida that he, and he was depressed. He wasn't living in the nicest of environments. Right. It'd be really easy to say, you know, this is a lot. And, you know, we we expect to have these changes, but I don't think we expect to always take them, you know, like we moved. At the, big, at the end of 2021, I moved out of the county that I'd lived in my entire life. But there were times it's like, I am really freaking homesick. And it's mostly because the shopping up here is not as good. Uh-huh. <laughs> it's further away. I got to go into Sacramento or, you know, it's at least half hour, 40 minute drive to get to decent shopping. And, you know, I'm just, it's not that I'm lazy, but I'm used to being able to, you know, drive five, 10 minutes and get to what I want to get to. So Right. You know, and when I felt those pangs of homesick, I had to remind myself why we were coming here. Mm-hmm. And even my husband dealt with that. So it's not necessarily, I don't think we would necessarily say, whoa, you know, you wanted to move up here or he wanted to retire to Florida. This is what you wanted to do. So why do you feel bad? Right. right. You know, it's just life is not, it's not a straight line. <laughs> That's definitely true. I don't That's- think we um, attribute moods to disease most of the time. And I don't know, maybe we, I don't know. I guess we need to pay more attention to people's mental health because I think it gives us a lot more clues as to what's going on physically, mentally, disease, no disease. I think that's right. I remember sitting in on one of Bruce's lectures at UCSF and he said that Changes in mood aren't necessarily reactions to the disease of dementia, but the disease itself, that it's actually uh, a clinical presentation, as the doctors call it. And I thought that was a very interesting idea. And I think maybe in my dad's case, true. Uh, There were other... I think symptoms along the way, maybe what we would call modifiable risk factors now. Uh, We all know that it's important to treat depression because Mm -hmm. that is a risk factor for dementia. Uh, In addition to hearing problems that he had many years before the diagnosis, in addition to sleeping issues. And so we know that if someone's having hearing issues, you really want to get them to an audiologist and uh, have hearing aids. In the case of sleep, we know that not sleeping well can either be a causal factor with dementia or an effect. It's not clear. And so I think there were interventions along the way that we didn't know about, but now Mm -hmm. we do. Now we do. I feel like we've learned a lot in the last 10 years. Let's see, I've been doing this podcast for almost five. I'm in the fifth year. I started in 2018, this is 2022. So yeah, four years. But it was like in the beginning, like my grandmother had vascular dementia. My maternal great-grandmother had what they called senile dementia back in the day. It's mm-hmm. interesting that you said back in the 80s, all dementias with Alzheimer's. Because I don't think in the 60s that was the case. My Mm. maternal great-grandmother died before I was born, so I don't know very much about her, but I just know that family history is is terrifying. It's why why I do all of the lifestyle things that they say you need to do. 
Mm -hmm. Um, Sometimes I think my guests from the East Coast must think I'm really lazy because I'm not usually available until late morning to start my work day because I make sure to have a healthy breakfast and work out and Mm -hmm. read and do all those good things. So I hope that's good for my brain (laughs) because I seriously don't want to end up like my mom. But um, and sleep is definitely important. But I feel like we have learned a lot in just the last five, 10 years. So, you know, the eighties that we were talking about 40 years ago. Right. I know that because that's the year my husband graduated from high school, <laughs> but tell me about the trip from you were in, you were in Southern California headed to Berkeley for your right. graduate program and right. you, you and your dad were driving. Right. This is a story that I tell in the chapter on diagnosis and it was very nice my parents got me a car to start Berkeley with which was which was wonderful and we got a great deal in LA and we picked it up we picked up the car in LA it was a stick shift it was a Toyota Tercel it didn't have air conditioning and it had windows that you had to manually roll down. <laughs> it was uh, a really stripped car. Oh, so no and, cassette player? Uh, I don't even know if it had a cassette player, honestly. And uh, uh, my father always used to love to drive. And he taught me how to drive a stick shift. And so we were all set to have a really fun drive up to Berkeley and we were going to take the one Of course in California freeways all have names and identities and uh, lots of associations, I think in a way that maybe other freeways don't. So we were going to go up the one, which is the freeway closest to the Pacific ocean. And there are definitely some scary turns and frightening drops. Perhaps you know these. Yes, I do. It's a really great drive if you, if not a great drive, if you get car sick. Right. It's beautiful. Right. right. But it's, yeah, it's very, very twisty and right. so, narrow. <laughs> right. So I was driving and my dad was clearly frightened. And, uh, then he was so frightened in the course of the drive, which was so unlike him that he insisted that we go inland. And, uh, I can't remember if we ended up taking the one one or the five. Um, but it was this moment where, this thing that we used to love doing together, driving in the car and having nice conversations. The the views were frightening, but gorgeous. Uh, We were going to stay at this fun historic hotel and dad just wanted to get to Berkeley and be done with the drive. And which which from LA is not, not, it's doable. It's not hard. No, it's not hard. It's not hard. We, that's right. Um, and it was just very strange, the experience of seeing my dad scared. I, I don't think I'd ever seen him scared. And then he helped me settle into where I was going to be living my first year in Berkeley. And we had arguments, which that was strange. I mean, in my adolescence, we had had arguments, but, you know, we were extremely close, which I think comes through in the book. Um, Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons why I wanted to write the book, um, to share this amazing person with the world uh, and how much I loved him. And in the course of writing that first chapter on diagnosis that I didn't think I was going to write, what I realized was in part everything I needed to know about my father uh, and what was coming around the bend, i.e. his dementia, 
was apparent to me in that trip. The fear, the fighting, the mood change, the change in relationship and sort of, I think, most poignant and the hardest thing for me to write about and remember was saying goodbye to him at the San Francisco airport where he just wept. The only other time I'd seen my dad cry like that was when he um, put my dog to sleep, Taka. Mm -hmm. He came home that day and just was weeping. And I remember holding my dad at the San Francisco airport with him shaking and crying and telling him, I'm going to come see you in a few months. But I think the goodbye for him was much more than my goodbye to him. And he was saying goodbye to parts of himself, which I didn't realize at the time. And it was very hard to, I mean, each chapter that I wrote was difficult in its own way. Um, And that one was hard because it forced me to confront a kind of blindness on my part. The fact that I could have been able to see what was going on, like, I don't think really too many people could have, you know? So I was right. a little, little hard on myself or very hard on myself, which I tend to be. But that was the challenge of writing that chapter. Do you think he knew something was going on or it was more like subconscious? That's such a good question. There's a, there's a word that neurologists have for people who don't know that they have the disease. I can't remember. Oh, uh, index. Yes. Yeah. Um, I think sometimes he knew and sometimes he didn't. And I think he wanted to, uh, I'm going to get emotional. He wanted to protect me from him knowing. So even if he knew, it's not clear that he would have divulged that to me. So I I can, I can, I had not similar Because my grandmother had vascular dementia, I actually think she had mixed dementias, but one will not know at this point. She's been gone for 10 years. Okay. There was a day my mom didn't recognize her own handwriting. I mean, I knew something was going on. And I had taken the position of, I guess I was the hovering caregiver kind of person because I didn't want our clients to know she was having issues with her memory. Uh, And I didn't want, well, I didn't want my mom to know I was quote unquote supervising because that would have made her very angry and it would have been very ugly, but it mm. needed to be done. So it was very clandestine. Mm. But the day that she didn't recognize her handwriting, she says, well, I don't want to end up like my mother, you know, basically turned in a huff and stomped out of the room. And it was like, okay, (laughs) Mm. well, murder is illegal. So what the hell do you expect me to do, lady? And then it just seemed to like, she seemed to forget that. Uh And it was like, I'm the one that's like trying to figure out, for lack of a better term, WTF am I supposed to do now? And I think this was, it was before, so I was in my early to mid thirties, before I turned 40, I have to like do the math. (laughs) Math's not my thing. (laughs) So I, you know, I wonder if she, if she, slipped in and out of knowing and Mm -hmm. and obviously knowing something's wrong, but not understanding that's gotta be really terrifying. I think that's the harder, the hardest state, excuse me. The hardest stage is when they know, but they don't know. Right. And you are concerned, but you're not sure what the heck's going on. It's like just a complete bundle of confusion. Right. So he left, you started your PhD program. I know in the book you said you you went back as often as possible, but it wasn't super frequent. Am I correct on that? 
I probably went back um, twice a year to Florida and tried to stay for long swatches of time. And in part, I could do that because I was in graduate school and had a somewhat flexible calendar. We would meet uh, in Las Vegas, which was a place my parents really enjoyed going to. Uh, I would go to Maryland, where my sister lived and where my parents spent a lot of time. So maybe two or three times a year, something like that. So did you notice between those trips, did you notice big changes or were were they still kind of protecting you from what was going on? I noticed and didn't allow myself to fully feel what I was noticing. And I talk about in the book, kind of giving myself an anesthetic that lasted mm, over 20 years. Uh, And that writing the book allowed me to finally feel what the anesthesia, the (laughs) self-induced anesthesia um, was preventing me from fully feeling. I felt it. I felt it in, in dribs and drabs, but I had this crazy notion that I could be rational about my grief. And if I lost it when my father couldn't put film in a camera, which you used to have to do once upon a time, what was I going to do when he didn't know who I was or uh, so, so I, I somehow thought I could take my intellect and use that. Um, and I, I did, and I don't know, maybe, maybe it was helpful, but it certainly came back to bite me in the, you know, what, when my father died. So the writing of the book was basically processing the grief, which is where I was headed with this whole conversation, but I had to let you tell your story. How did you get connected with Dr. Bruce Miller and the UCSF? It's the Alzheimer's disease. Is it, they don't call it an ADRC. It's called the Memory and Aging Center. That's Mac. right. Yeah. So I should just say that I didn't know going into writing the book that that's what I was doing, processing my grief. I really did not know. What I knew was I wanted to tell the story of my father's dementia. I knew that the crux of what I wanted to, or the departure point, was the experience of me becoming an expert in language and words at the same time as my father was losing language. That was sort of the horrible synchronicity that I needed to talk about and get my head around. And I knew I didn't want to write the book alone. I didn't want it to be a memoir about me, about this girl from New Jersey, this middle-class Jewish person who went on to a PhD. I I just didn't know um, how much that specific story would resonate. And it was important for me to write a book that other people could um, get something out of. And I thought if it were just my individual story, that that would get in the way of um, a couple of things, of other people being able to uh, relate to the story. And it was also really important to me to write a book that had a scientist or a doctor or neurologist weighing in on what I was describing from the point of view of a daughter and someone who thinks about the world from the perspective of literature and novels. And it took me a while to find Bruce. I didn't uh, 
uh, interview uh, <laughs> uh, other doctors, but I did talk to other people about writing the book with me. I thought it made sense to find someone in LA and that didn't work out. And then some of my colleagues at Caltech pointed me to Bruce at UCSF. And I sent an email to Bruce and to my utter delight and dismay, he wrote back. I told him I was going to be in Berkeley doing some research. He said, come to UCSF, we'll talk. And we had a great meeting, uh, first meeting. We really hit it off. I loved his sense of humor. I think he liked mine. And in that meeting, he explained to me that mem the Memory and Aging Center at UCSF had an interdisciplinary program uh, called the Global Brain Health Initiative. And Bruce asked me, uh, and this is a direct quote, do you want to learn some science? <laughs> and I said, yes. And he said, you need to apply to this program. And I applied and I got in and Caltech was very supportive and gave me a year to go to UCSF to study neurology in this very interdisciplinary program where I got to go to grand rounds, which is when doctors present their work to uh, the people in the community. I got to uh, shadow doctors uh, who were giving uh a various dementia test to their patients. Of course, the patients had to agree to let me sit in. I got to listen to a genetic counselor, talk to someone who had FTD in their family and hear about uh, whether or not he was going to learn the results of his genetic tests and what that might mean for the rest of his family. If he knew, what did he owe to his sister and brother? It was fascinating. And my goal was to learn enough neurology to be able to, quote unquote, set the table for Bruce, to then be able to explain the neurology behind the, the, the symptoms, the clinical presentations that I described um, my father um, having experienced. That's one of the unique and interesting parts of, well, the whole book is you talk about your personal story and then he comes in with obviously a, a more scientific explanation of what's going on. So it's, it's, you really get a full, full picture, which is different than everybody, everybody else's books that I've read to date, which I've read a lot. But along the way, you realize that you were basically, I think the the phrase you used was you ended up sitting Shiva for your dad again. Right. By writing this book. Right. So what did you learn about yourself and processing this grief 20 plus years later? Now we're going to take a quick break for an ad. These ads help me continue to bring the show to you for free. When I learned that despite eating as healthy as possible, we can still have undernourished brains. I was frustrated. I also live in a farming community, so I'm aware that our food isn't grown as well as we need. Learning about neural reserves, Relevate, and how it's formulated to fix this problem convinced me to give them a try. Now I know many of you are skeptical, as was I. However, I know it's working because of one simple change. My sweet tooth is gone. I didn't expect that, and it's not something other users have commented on, but here's some truth. My brain always wanted something sweet. Now fruit usually did the trick, but not always. One bad night's sleep would fire up my sugar cravings so much they were almost impossible to ignore. You ever have your brain screaming for a donut? Well, for me, those days are gone. It's been about six months since I started taking the supplement and I have no regrets. I believe in my results so much that I'm passing on my 15% discount to you. Try it for two or three months and see if you have a miraculous sweet tooth cure or maybe just better focus and clarity. It's definitely worth a try. Now back to our conversation. So the sitting Shiva part came at the very end of my year 
at UCSF. I wrote the preface last. And this light bulb went on because I started remembering a lot of things which I hadn't let myself remember. So the last chapter in the book is called is memory. I actually thought that was going to be the first chapter because when I started the program, I thought all dementia was about memory. And in the course of studying uh, neurology and dementia, I learned that that is not true. Um, And at one point, Bruce said to me, you know, Cindy, these anecdotes are all very interesting and well-written, but your book needs an arc. And so again, it was Bruce who helped me realize that the memory chapter needed to come last because what the book allowed me to do was to remember both the very difficult and painful things that I had not confronted directly about my father's illness. But I think just as importantly, I was able to remember my dad before he got sick. And so the memory chapter is me just kind of celebrating all these things about my dad that I just adored. And after I wrote that chapter on memory, the last chapter, what I then remembered was when my father died and when we sat Shiva when he died. And uh, this is sort of a Jewish tradition sitting Shiva for those who may not be familiar with it. um, Usually you have uh, about a week or so where people come and they visit your house and they bring very unhealthy food for the most part. (laughs) And you sit around and you talk about the wonderful things about the person who's died. And what I recalled about that Shiva was we did not do that. Mm. It was too painful. Or maybe some people were having that conversation, but I was just in my own universe of uh, deep, deep sadness And talking about everything I loved about my father, I just, I couldn't do it because in my mind, um, so much of what defined him was his illness. Uh, It just kind of wiped out everything else in its path, including the 25 years I had had with him before he was sick. And so what I, came to understand was that going to UCSF and reading a ton of memoirs and studying neurology was my way of sitting Shiva and that I had asked Bruce to sit with me. And he said, yes. What was it like studying neurology? I mean, you're a, a, an English professor, a literary person. This does not seem like the same part of the brain. <laughs> I, I tell people right. that if I was half my age and had twice the scientific aptitude, I would probably go into brain research, even yeah. as maybe a volunteer, because I'm sure nobody would pay me for my <laughs> skills, you know, because I find the brain just so fascinating. But I right. think I think the science would trip me up terribly. But I that's the one thing while reading the book, I was like, this this literary word person is studying the brain and just. It's almost hard to put those two pieces together. So what was that like? It must have been fascinating. It it was great. The the cohort that I was with, the interdisciplinary cohort was wonderful. We had we had geriatricians, we had neurologists, we had a photographer from Peru, we had an epidemiologist. Uh, There were all sorts of people committed to studying neurology, many of whom, like me, did not have a scientific background at all. And on the one hand, it was familiar, my uh, having no idea what's going on because I teach at Caltech and often find myself in seminars and I had an administrative position where I had to 
listened to all sorts of talks where I spent most of the time Googling one word <laughs> and then Googling another word. So I did a lot of that for sure. Um, uh, the, the way the program was organized twice a week, we had uh, seminars where we did reading and learned about uh, neurology from the amazing faculty at UCSF and the nursing staff. Uh, it was truly just, I, and I love being a student. So I got to be a student, which was great. Uh, when there were some intersections, I have to say, Bruce it, does a lot of work on the empathy circuitry in dementia and how in frontotemporal dementia, that circus circuitry gets damaged. And I had thought a lot about issues of sympathy and empathy in American literature. So there was that overlap. One thing that I never learned how to do, Bruce told me I would, and this is probably the only thing he was wrong about. He told me that uh, when the year was over, I would know how to read an MRI or a PET scan. And I was completely befuddled. I would attend uh, uh, very diligently these seminars where these amazing neurologists would say, oh, see that deterioration in the, you know, uh, the occipital lobe or see where that gyrus is not looking like it's supposed to do. And I would try and look at these images and for the life of me could not see at all what these people were seeing. And yet what I realized was that what they did with the PET scans and the MRIs is what I do with words. They were doing close reading of these images and hats off to them for being able to see, you know, the, uh, the deterioration. I mean, thank God we have people <laughs> who can do close readings of those images. I am not one of them, but I know how to close read a book or a poem. And so there was both kind of an intersection, but a divergence. And that was the case with a lot of the things I learned that year. And uh, it was just such a gift uh, to be able to study just a little bit of neurology. As I said, enough, enough so that I could use some of the words in my own description of what was happening to my father. And then Bruce could explain the science to the reader in a way that the reader could hopefully understand. This is a fellowship. What in general for those non-academics like myself, yeah. is this just like, what is the point of a fellowship? I mean, obviously it benefited you tremendously and you've yeah. written this very interesting book that would hopefully benefit our society. But what is like the academic point of having a literary person studying neurology? <laughs> That yeah. just seems like obviously you're not going to practice neurology, right? So right. Fill us non-academics in. That's a that's a great question. So what the fellowship allowed me to do uh, was to, and Caltech had to agree to this, and I can explain why Caltech might want to agree to this. Um, it allowed me to go to UCSF and study at an institution where. Um, where I don't teach and, and to sort of learn enough about a different discipline that I was able to write this book. Now, why might Caltech want me to take advantage of this fellowship opportunity? And I don't think Caltech would be the only school that would, would do this, but institutions, universities um, are very interested in interdisciplinary study. And at Caltech, which is a school known for its science, technology, engineering, and math, STEM, having someone in the humanities uh, learn neurology or a little bit of neurology fits in with their mission mm. of having people, faculty, students, uh, who can speak different languages and sort of do translation. 
And so my skill as an English professor, I hope in the book, allowed me to do some translating for general readers. Um, And what I wanted to translate was both my love for my father, uh, my love of literature, uh, and a little bit of uh, what I learned about neurology. And then Bruce comes in and does the translation from the (laughs) scientific point of view. You definitely accomplished your goal in the book. Thank you. It's, it's, and it's really interesting because it when it switches between you and Bruce, font changes. Yes. When you know, like there's a visual cue that right. somebody else is talking now. And right. but it's it's just the the language is very different. So it's really it's really unique. I've read a lot of books. I like reading. So it's I, I appreciated the uniqueness and the way the information is um, not translated. Projected is like the only word I can come up with at the moment. Uh-huh. But so they basically the purpose of the fellowship is to help you be a little bit more. Not necessarily well-rounded, but like I can't speak STEM. <laughs> All uh-huh. those things are not in my wheelhouse, right. but maybe a fellowship not like yours. I'm not sure that's even in my my wheelhouse either, but that would help. I mean, maybe it would help me learn things that would help with what I do now. I don't know. Yes. But that's the whole point of a fellowship is to kind of balance things a little more, for lack of a better term. That's true. And it depends on the fellowship. This is a very unique one. There are other fellowships, uh, like the Guggenheim Fellowship, for example, where you are given uh, money to uh, finish a book. You're not teaching. The Guggenheim Foundation supports your salary so that you can have time to do your work. Uh, The Guggenheim also likes to um, fund artists so that they can do their work. So it really depends on the fellowship. But the idea is most often to give the scholar, the thinker, time and to give them support and often to put them in uh, uh, a cohort that's um, that's interdisciplinary so that uh, people can learn from other disciplines and take the best that other disciplines have to offer. Definitely is a a good thing with you know the more like i'm a very curious person so i love obviously talking to different people like yourself and and i'm always amazed i've been doing this i've got 230 ish episodes done as as this recording is being made Mm -hmm. and everybody's story is different but there's still that same commonality the same Mm -hmm. theme and you you'd think after a while i'd run out of things people to talk to and, <laughs> and topics to discuss. That always blows my mind. I just got an email yesterday about another author, you know, writing about the connection between um, tick-borne illnesses and Alzheimer's. And I was like, oh, that's just fun. You know, oh, it's boy. like never wow. even heard of that. And I've been, you know, I've been in this world longer than I would have ever liked to, but right. it is, it is, it always surprises me when people are not curious about learning, you know, at least dipping your toe into learning a little bit more about the brain or literature or wherever your weakness, for lack of a better term, is. Uh-huh. But in the writing of this book, because you, you kept talking about how you kind of used your intellect as kind of a barrier to processing what was going on, which right. I think is really common. I lost my mom at the start of the pandemic. And because of the pandemic and annoying family members who shall not be named, um, my mom has never been interned with my dad. Uh And um, I'm probably the horrible person because I haven't made that happen, even though I don't know why it's solely my responsibility. And there's times I feel really guilty because, you know, we've never, we've never, quote, done anything, although I have. So it's it's just interesting, but it's, I also have the same issue of not, not being able to remember, like, I think back to my childhood and I think, why, why is all the stuff that I'm remembering negative? 
hate mm. that. Mm. So I wonder if that's, I just need to, you know, cause it's only been a little more than two years since my mom passed away. So uh, maybe I still got some processing to do, <laughs> uh-huh. but what did you learn about the pro, you know, processing grief with somebody that, you know, obviously you were young when he was diagnosed. I was pretty young when my mom started showing signs. Right. It took a long time to get her diagnosed because she was uh, <laughs> reluctant to get diagnosed. Mm-hmm. I think it, I think it wasn't. She was mid stage for sure. I I think she didn't know what was going on by the time she was actually uh, officially diagnosed. Mm. But I think you know it's like you were getting your PhD. I was raising my daughter. You know, we're trying to do life and right. at the same time deal with this person who's. You know, their life is going backwards, their skills, they're losing skills, they're losing words, they're losing abilities. I think sometimes it's just really hard to process. Is that what you kind of discovered in the writing of this book? Yes, absolutely. And what I discovered was that my 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 strategy of compartmentalization was the best i could do at the time <laughs> and i think that's how most of us handle these challenges right right and i don't know if i had let myself feel if I would have finished my PhD, I, you know, I just did, who knows? Mm. Uh, what, I, what I also discovered in writing the book is kind of ironic that it was very important for me to find these words, really important. And yet words are not all they're cracked up to be. And so it was essential for me to get the words. But in doing that, what I realized was that in dealing with my father, and I wish I had done much more of this, um, words didn't matter. They didn't, because he, at a certain point, he, you know, he always knew who I was. And I talk about this. He always knew in the sense that he always knew that I was someone he loved. How he communicated that to me was through his eyes, through his body, through his touch, not words. And so that strikes me as very important to know. Um, and just a deep irony. <laughs> I'm not <laughs> sure what else what else to say about that, but I learned that. Well, deep irony is actually a perfect term. And I think we spend so much time trying to keep up with our own lives, especially for those of us whose parent has this disease young. Um, or if we're the spouse, you know, you're you're trying to take care of this person. And there's definitely not enough support or, I mean, there's a lot of stuff out there. It's just so far flung and, you know, you got to spend a lot of time looking for it. Right. Which there are people that are trying to make that better, but holy Toledo, it's just, we, we need to do better. But I, you know, it's like, you just want to wrap your arms around them and protect them from this disease that you can't. And you try to make everything as good as possible because obviously we want to give them as much joy and quality of life, but it's like fighting a losing battle and it's yeah. hard and it's just, and it's hard to, you, you feel guilty if you're, you know, you take time off and you go get your nails done or you go on a little trip or whatever you like, that was, that was hard for me was because my dad passed away and I became responsible for my mom. And I would just get angry. I'm like, she should be hanging out with the grandkids and and right. traveling and doing all the things to the house that my dad always fought. <clears throat> and it just that that was hard because I'm right. like, 
why did she didn't deserve this? She, right. you know, did all, you know, just like your dad did everything to, you know, have a stable, loving, happy family. And then to just get run over with this disease is just, it's, I think we need to have a lot more conversations about the emotions behind it because mm-hmm. I think it's typical for caregivers to compartmentalize because I don't know how else you would deal with this because if there's so many unknowns, it comes out of the blue, you find yourself all of a sudden, you know, up to your eyebrows and caregiving when you were like, I'm working on my PhD. What do you mean? I got to do this other stuff. It's just, I, 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 it's just, it's a lot. And yeah. even though like you, you know, your mom was doing the most of the caregiving, right. You know, my mom was in a memory care, but I still, you know, I was still in charge. Right. I, was, I always like to say I was the captain of her care team. Mm-hmm. And it just, it takes over your life and we got to figure out, I don't know. Right. I think that's a lot. There's another interdisciplinary, like we need to bring in all the psychologists and the psychotherapists to help. Absolutely. Help people plot a healthy, mentally healthy plant path forward, which of course differs with every human, just like Alzheimer's differs with everybody. So right. I'm only asking for the moon here. <laughs> <laughs> I I have big dreams sometimes, right? <laughs> but hopefully we'll find a prevention and a cure and a treatment so that we don't have to build this great wall of caregiving. To you know, at least that's my goal. That's what I'm hoping for. Everybody can feel free to put me out of business. <laughs> this is this is a passion project, so it's not really a business. But still, you can make yeah. me uh, unnecessary, and that would be okay. Mm-hmm. Although I don't know what I'd do with myself after that. <laughs> Is there anything that you want to tell the listeners besides that they, they should definitely read this book because it's it's fascinating and touching and super informative? Thank Is there you. any words of wisdom that you want to share with people before I let you go out into the heat today? Or I guess you guys are, are having monsoonal weather today. <laughs> yes, we are. It's it's bizarre. <laughs> I uh, would only say, and this sort of goes back to the earlier part of our conversation, um, that there are interventions that you can uh, take if you or a loved one um, are experiencing insomnia, get it checked. Maybe all you're going to need is a CPAP, uh, but uh, it, it's a risk factor, uh, but it's a modifiable one, which is important. If you're having trouble hearing, get it checked. If you're having well, changes in mood, if you're apathetic or your loved one is, get it checked. And I think um, it's also important And I didn't know this before I studied at UCSF and it's kind of a cliche at this point, but whatever is good for your body is good for your brain. And so if you need to lose 10 or 20 pounds, um, work on that because that's good for your brain. And also, and this gets to um, something you were talking about, Jennifer, you know, you're love of learning and new things and asking questions that's good for your brain that's Mm -hmm. called developing your cognitive reserve and whatever you can do to uh, increase your cognitive reserve uh, which is which is basically I think just kind of making your brain stronger Um, do it read that's good that's good for your brain. And so I think we didn't know about a lot of these risk factors. I know we didn't know about them years ago, but now that we know, um, it, it's, in, it's important to, um, to intervene when you think something may be a problem. So I would just end with that. That's excellent advice. And I've always learned, I've the phrase that I've always heard, well, not always, but it's come up a lot more recently is heart health is also brain health. So all yeah. the things we know about having a healthy heart yep. applies to your brain. 
And learning, if it's like a lot of people think, you know, do a crossword puzzle, which I suck at. <laughs> you know, just cannot do them. Don't give me a Sudoku. No, please. Thank you. They just, uh -huh. I don't like that. They just, I don't know what, if it's a visual thing, I don't know what it is. I just, uh -huh. I'm terrible at them. Mm -hmm. But I've learned different art forms and, you know, a whole new career because I was a photographer and anything that requires like concentrating to learn, you have to like yeah. think hard on it, kind of the squinty face thinking. That's when you build up the neurons that they didn't think we could build. They thought that the neuroplasticity uh, have enough science background to be dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> but that's because I've talked to enough people. Right. But you, they didn't think you could build up more neuroplasticity after age 25 or 30. And now they realize that that is incorrect. Continuously right. build neurons and basically a nimble brain, which is a loose definition of neuroplasticity forever. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a use it or lose it. You know what? Right. You might want to, if you're retiring, learn a new hobby. Right. What's the, what's the, what's the harm other than your bank account might get hit. Right. <laughs> but this has been fantastic. I, like I said, I highly okay. recommend the book. It Thank is linked in the episode notes. So you guys can just click through and check it out. And I'm super fascinated that a literary person studied neurology for a year. That one just, it's, I just find that impressive and interesting and. Thank you. We're on opposite ends of the state, but maybe one of these days we can get together and you can tell me more about it. I'd love that. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jennifer. Fading Memories is also available wherever you get your favorite podcasts.